All right, happy Monday. And uh, today we get to see a, uh, a new family, a new family uh, of plants that has also gotten some uh, controversies. Uh, many, many, many years ago, this was a gigantic plant family. And uh, as I keep mentioning in uh, previous seminars, that now the genetic has made it a lot smaller. And so here we have uh, some tulips, which we've seen that uh, is going to be the type specimen since you're already familiar with that. Uh, so we get to see the family that is known as the lily family or uh, lily ACE. And now it has more or less gone to 15 genera, which is a small family uh, and uh, 600 plus uh, species, mainly in, uh, native to the northern hemisphere. Uh, but there is some very important members in California. Uh, so some of them are going to be almost unique to our area. Uh, so California being uh, extremely uh, a hotspot for endemism and endemic plants. So there's going to be several subfamilies, uh, but we get to only discuss some of the better ones uh, that are out here. Now, before we get into the real Liliaceae, there is uh, some clear, uh, clarification that we have to do. Uh, first of all, we've seen uh, daylily. Uh, fortunately, those are not in the true lily family, even though they carry the common name of uh, lily or daylily. And then you might see gloriosa lily that falls into a very different uh, family group. Uh, we can keep going to the Peruvian lily or Astromeria that falls under Astromeria ACE, its own family group. Uh, you might see our Amaryllis lily or naked lily, uh, naked lady that falls into the Amaryllis family. And uh, even our Aztec lily uh, and or our tiger lily. So once again, some uh, similar plants, but they are in a very different family. They just share the common name of uh, lily. Uh, now the true lily is going to be the tulip. The tulip that we see here and for the most part uh, there's going to be some kind of bulb or some kind of underground structure so we know that the tulips have a bulb and that is a mechanism for surviving in the northern hemisphere where it gets going to get cold at a certain period of time or in california it may get dry really really dry uh, during the summer so the only way for the plants to survive is to go dormant during the, those harsh uh, seasons. Uh, and so they're going to have some kind of bulb, some kind of uh, underground structure that will allow them to come up every single uh, growing season. Uh, if we look at the flower, uh, this is going to be uh, the flower parts. It is your typical high school flower biogram, uh, which is going to have uh, your stigma and the ovary. There is a new word here, uh, the word people. Now we've learned before sepals and petals. Now here is tepal or tipo. And so that is the word that is referred to or used when there is no clear distinction between the petals and the sepals. They're both the same width, they're both the same color, they're both the same uh, girth. And so they look exactly the same. So when the petals and the sepals look exactly the same, they're referred to as tipos, a few other plants that have the same thing or they use the same word, uh, the orchids, for example. So just be aware of the word tipo in case you see it is when the petals and sepals are look exactly the same. Uh, so we're gonna have uh, six petals and sepals. Uh, and then we're going to have, have uh, the anthers with uh, the filaments or the male component and the female component. Very simple. There's not going to be too much deviation from this. There's not going to be too much specialization from this uh, general drawing of uh, the true uh, lily. Once we cut uh, the ovary open, uh, we see the very small style. And then we see where the seeds would uh, come out. So that being the fruit. Uh, here is just a simple uh, 
uh, photograph of uh, a tulip, kind of showing you the above uh, ground portion of uh, the flowers. And so the tulips and uh, the true lilies will fall under the subfamily Liliioidae. Uh, so lily like uh, family. Uh, and so here it's a uh, Trader Joe's or some of your local stores during Easter. Uh, they happen to have those available uh, for you to purchase. And uh, there is an important value for uh, cut flowers. Uh, I would like to point out that all of the bulbs that you see out there uh, are grown in the Netherlands. Holland is one of the biggest bulb uh, producers uh, in the world. So we have uh, some of the cut flowers that are ready for repurchase. And uh, this is how they are grown. Uh, they are not grown in those beautiful fields that you might have seen some photograph on uh, Instagram and or Twitter or any of the other social medias. Uh, when they are going to be grown for the cut flower, they are put in these crates. Uh, and then they get placed in the fridge. The fridge is mimicking a winter. So the plants are not going to do anything. And so when there's the demand, when uh, Easter is coming, Mother's Day is coming, Valentine's Day is coming, or whatever holiday is uh, on its way, then they timely or they time the bringing the bulbs out. And once they are out, they think the winter is over. And now they are going to set flowers and they are going to then be harvested and then killed. Uh, and then the flowers are being shipped over here. So it's a brutal life. Uh, their whole life is going to be in a plastic crate as you can see right here. Uh, if you have not seen uh, the Botany of Desire, you should uh, have a look at it. It is a very good view of uh, the past when uh, tulips was uh, the currency. So things were valued in tulips and the biggest and the rarest and the most uh, magnificent tulip uh, would be worth millions and millions of dollars. So an entire economy based on plant, tulip. And so if you've not had the chance to see this, the Botany of Desire, you should uh, have a look at it. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting. And uh, I mentioned before, the tulips that we see out there are, will not come uh, back uh, during the spring. So you have to get them again or to go through a big process or put them in the fridge. However, this is uh, Tulipa cruciana, which is a native tulip from the Mediterranean, which is closer to our climate. And so this one is growing wild in Fullerton Arboretum, and it will come back. So if you have a chance to find it, Tulipa clausiana, uh, do so, because it's worth uh, growing. It's very, very uh, pretty, and uh, it's not as hybridized as uh, your standard uh, flowering uh, uh, commercial tulip, but it is quite a nice uh, species if you get a chance to grow. And then we have uh, the true lilies, uh, which are going to be the genus Lilium. And this is where we have many that are going to be native to California. So as you go from southern to south to north, you're going to find different types of lilies that might have a very, very specific growing range. Uh, the one on the image is our Humboldt lily. And here it is uh, growing out of the ground. So there is a bulb somewhere underneath it. And uh, there's going to be a very large cluster of flowers that will come out. Uh, most of these are going to be in some kind of danger because the moment people see this big, gigantic flower spike, they're going to dig up the bulbs and take them. Or they might, in the old days, people used to eat them. So Native Americans ate them. And so they would actively search for them for feeding themselves. Uh, here it is uh, with me in front uh, for scale. So I'm standing right where the plant is coming out of the ground. So they can be quite nice. Um, most of this can be found uh, associated with some kind of river or uh, wash or something. Uh, so kind of a, uh, a river edge or stream edge or where water may run through. Uh, riparian is the right word. Uh, and here's uh, the flowers uh, in a beautiful sunset. And you can see some of the nice uh, flowers right here. So beautiful plants, uh, the Humboldt lily native to Southern California and a close up. Uh, and uh, here's a different one uh, and uh, a 
different one right here. So now uh, in the same uh, genus, Lilium, we have our Asiatic lilies. And those are the ones that you're gonna see in the market uh, for flowers. Uh, some of them have been extremely hybridized where there is no more reproductive structure. It, it looks almost like a multi-petal individual. And so this is uh, an extreme uh, hybridization of uh, the plant. And so when we look at the reproductive structure, exactly the same thing. Uh, the stigma leading to the ovary underneath and then the anthers and the filaments and then the T poles that are gonna be there as well. So the same kind of mechanism and standards. Uh, there are, however, some lilies that are edible. If you happen to ever go into 99 Ranch or some of uh, the stores that are catered to Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, there's this uh, bowl, and they sell it as a lily bowl. Uh, so you get a chance. It's already been through a fridge. Uh, do not eat it. Put it in a pot, and you can grow sometimes uh, this really magnificent uh, burgundy lily or sometimes this uh, uh, orange lily that I've grown when I've taken them in, in the garden, in the greenhouse. And uh, I've grown this and every single time anybody sees it, they always wanna buy it. And I say, just go to the store and get yourself some of those bulbs. Uh, it's a great plant uh, and it's a great flower if you get a chance and it's at your local 99 ranch or local real retail store. Uh, and then we have Easter Lily. Easter Lily was uh, two uh, last week, I think. Uh, so that became more of the symbol for that because of the white, pure white flowers. And so you will normally see them uh, during the Easter season. Uh, and there's a, a few more. And uh, just a few more uh, of the different types of lilies and the different colors that you may come across uh, out there. Some of them with uh, multi-petal, multi-color. Uh, there's one with yellow and bronze, pink, uh, more of a pinkish color right there. And uh, this one I happened to see at a Sherman Library. And it was very interesting. So it's a beautiful lily, uh, kind of same pattern. What is very interesting about this plant is that it produces bulblets right on the stem. So where there should be a branch that will come out, come out, grow out here, it's just a compressed bulb uh, that you are, all you gotta do is just yank them or pick them, they all not naturally fall off. Uh, and uh, you don't need to bury them, just put them on top of the soil. There's already, already roots developed. And so you can easily multiply this individual. So many lilies do have the ability to make some kind of uh, aerial bulb that you can plant in the ground and propagate it. Uh, Naples Islands, I happened to find uh, this uh, individual growing uh, when I was walking with a class a couple of years ago uh, or in a different garden, striving arboretum, I happened to find uh, this individual is growing. Or in Venice, California, uh, Venice Beach area, I happened to find uh, this one growing in uh, uh, some of the neighborhoods and even in a parkway mixed with uh, the non real lily, the lily on the side or in the back. Uh, we have this one right here, which is really nice. Now, going back to California, this is the genus Fritalia or Frillery. This is known as the chocolate lily. And it is in serious danger because they can only grow in a very specific clay like soil. So they don't grow in decomposed granite, they don't grow in the beach. So the soil has to be very precise. And so it is often destroyed, that type of soil is destroyed or washed away or uh, it's overtaken by other uh, plants. Uh, and so we were fortunate to find it in Griffith Park and here you see it uh, coming out of the ground. And here you see it's a very small plant, uh, but you're gonna have this beautiful bell-shaped flowers that are gonna be dark purple brown in color and that's where the name chocolate lily comes from. Uh, again, as you venture from North to South uh, California, you may find different variations of it and a few other in the genus. Uh, there's a few European uh, species that are in cultivation uh, and they're also being hybridized, but this is uh, the species. Uh, 
uh, that is native to here, Southern California. And there's the face view that kind of looks like a tulip. Uh, and then we have a different subfamily. This is the Calocortoidae or in the genus Calocortus, which are gonna be the Mariposa lilies that are also gonna be very nice uh, for us here in Southern California. So if we look at this uh, Mariposa lily, I like to refer to Mariposa lilies as the Western tulip or the California tulip. <coughs> yes, we have a tulip, not the European, and uh, ours is, can be quite nicer than the European. The secret to growing our Calocortus here in Southern California is you must not give it any kind of summer water. So during the summer, they're gonna go dormant below the ground, let them dry do not water them because you water them you're going to rot them so find a place that's away from all irrigation uh, plant them know where they are and they can become established they can become naturalized they can come back every single year if you make sure you don't water them uh, during uh, the winter so within that category we have our toad lily which unfortunately i have only seen it in being shown in a, a horticulture society but i've not had a chance to grow it However, Calocortus, I, I like to find them. So whenever I go hiking, I always search for them. Uh, this is one of my first uh, that I found. This is Calocortus Catalini or the California, sorry, Catalina Island uh, Mariposa Lily. The common name Mariposa Lily is just making a reference that the flower from a distance may look like a butterfly that is gonna be fly, uh, fluttering on top of the grass. And that's just the common name. Their bulb is edible. You're gonna to have to dig very deep and it's gonna be very hard, but it is, was eaten or it was used as food by Native Americans. And uh, people may still every so often go out there and hunt them, uh, but please do not go out there and eat them because they're, they're not that good. Uh, so here's the side view. Uh, it's known as Catalina Mariposa lily because it was first discovered or found in Catalina or the description came from the Catalina species. Uh, but these ones are growing from uh, Griffith Park, so they also go into the mainland. Here's the face view, and uh, they are going to be characterized by having a lot of hairs uh, inside uh, the flowers. Uh, and when we look at it from the side, so here is uh, beautiful. And uh, here's some of the insects that I was able to record. Uh, visiting this flower. Uh, and then uh, Catalina uh, Mariposa lily flowers in the early spring, more like right now or into the summer. Then you have uh, the plumbers, uh, Mariposa lily, so Calocortes plumeri. Uh, so here it is uh, growing out of the decomposed granite, uh, very dry now. And uh, these photographs were uh, after after the fire from 2007. So they are going to be very nice to observe after fires, unfortunately, for the people who might be experiencing the fires. Uh, but because there's nothing around to block their view, you can find them in very large numbers and they're going to be quite nice. Uh, so here's just several of them that have synchronized their flower. Uh, and so that's why you don't see anything underneath it or nothing blocking. Uh, there's the side view. Uh, and there's a face view of this, and even inside the flower, uh, you have the beautiful hairs right there, uh, and, and the, the beautiful glands, and some of the pollinators that I happen to find on this plumber. Uh, also in Griffith Park, we have the yellow, or the golden mariposa lily, uh, Calocortus clavarum. We only know it from one locality, just one area where we know it grows, and that's it. Uh, so very restricted. We're still looking for more populations, but so far we only know it from one. So here it's just growing out of the grassy area. Uh, there's when it was kind of a nice year where there were several of them. Uh, there's the side view and that is just a bump is a nectary gland. Uh, there's the face view of this and uh, also a lot of insects that happen to be there. Now, previous was Griffith Park. This one is from O'Melveny Park. So in 2007, shortly after Griffith Park, there was another fire in the North Valley. And so I had a chance to go there and see. And uh, this has, has to be some of the best display of uh, this golden mariposa lily that I happened to see. And uh, so here's a side view of it. 
uh, and uh, some more right there, and a uh, few face view right there, and uh, just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful golden yellow. And uh, this one again goes from north to south, uh, and just a little bit of variation. And uh, in Shadow Ranch, which is part of the Santa Monica Mountains, I happened to find after a fire in 2007, a different fire. Uh, then I found uh, Calocortes venustus, which means uh, very, very pretty, very beautiful. Uh, here's the side view of this uh, beautiful mariposa lily, uh, different view. And the inside looks just like that. There's a nectary glands and there's uh, uh, those. And so here's some of the insects that happen to visit that flower. Now, if we jump over the ocean, this is Catalina. And so this are uh, the mariposa lilies that you see right here, uh, just growing in, in a grassy field. Uh, so this is uh, Calocortes uh, splendens, uh, the splendid mariposa lily, uh, growing right here with a nice lavender flower. And uh, this is in Otay uh, Mesa. I had a chance to go by the border of Mexico and US and I happened to find this uh, really nice. Uh, still, I need to find out what it is, uh, but it's a, definitely a Calocortus or a Mariposa lily. Uh, and uh, if we hop down to Baja California, this is from San Quintin uh, in some of the lava fields or now extinct lava fields, extinct volcano field. Uh, that's growing out of the lava rock. We have some beautiful uh, Calocortus splendens uh, right there. Uh, coming out and some of the visitors uh, that decided to visit the flower. Here's a different one. Uh, and uh, even we found a yellow one there that I, uh, it's clavados, but we just haven't identified the variety. Or uh, Calocortus wenlandi, uh, this one right here. And uh, in San Luis Obispo, there is Calocortus obispoensis. So just native to the, whatever they refer to as the San Luis Obispo, area. Uh, so obispoensis uh, right here. Uh, so I happen to be in out there in the summer and I happen to spot uh, several of these plants and uh, this one with a big bumblebee. Or they have their own version of uh, the golden yellow one, clavatus, uh, here uh, with a nice view. And uh, when you see the hairs, notice that they look like club. Uh, club. So that's why they're referred to as clavatus. Uh, so there's going to be some variations of those uh, so, and then uh, the last photographs, uh, when I went to Kew Botanic Garden, they had this really nice children garden, probably one of the best that I've seen. Uh, and they have this beautiful lily flower that was for children to play. So child will go in and uh, they'll touch uh, the stamens and the stigma. That means that pollination took place and then the flower will uh, begin to glow. So with that, uh, I will, will conclude the lily family. And I'll see you, uh, or I'll post it, and I'll hopefully you stay safe, and uh, hopefully I'll get to see you very soon. Bye.